This is going to be 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to look at honoring your father, honoring the heavenly father and your earthly father. But this is going to be verse by verse through John chapter 3, and we're also going to look at that subject. So verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Notice it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh. He died for your sins. He is one with the Father. You can't explain it, and I can't explain it, but the Father loved us sinners, and He died for us. If you have a good earthly Father, then He loves you. Our Heavenly Father is hated by the world, and we need to stick by Him no matter what persecution from the world comes our way. John says in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. So, God Himself manifested himself in the flesh the bible says god was manifested in the flesh and he died on the cross for the sins of the whole world that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not so the world knows us not because it knew him not this world hates god and they hate you for sticking with god and i got to thinking about this my grandfather raised me. He was my father. And there were times when people didn't like me simply because of who my father was. Maybe someone is mean to you because they don't like your father. It really isn't you who is rejected, but your father. Just like when the world hates you, they really hate your heavenly father and what he stands for. And back in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So the people didn't reject Samuel. They were actually rejecting God, his father. Now the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Marvel not if the world hate you, you know it hated God before it hated you. Now, 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, notice John said, We are the sons of God. So being as vile as we are, the Lord still claims us as his son. Just like a true father will claim his earthly son as his son, no matter what. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So you don't become a son of God until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now there are different types of sons of God in the Scriptures. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son, according to John 3.16. Angels are sons of God that aren't begotten, according to Je Genesis 6.4, Job 1.6, and Hebrews 5 and verse 5. Adam was a different kind of son of God, as it calls him in Luke 3.38. Now, the Heavenly Father is a good Father with many sons. And the new versions of the Bible will change John 3.16 to say He gave His one and only Son. And this is way off because He has many sons. It's just that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. Now, 1 John 3.2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him for we shall see him as he is. So we are going to be like the Lord, and I want to be like the Lord, just like you want to be like your dad. Kids look up to their dad. They want to be like him. Now here in verse 2, John is referring to the rapture, where our bodies will be changed according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. And then Philippians 3, 21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So we're going to get a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son. 
He is one of the three persons of the Godhead. And the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. Yet Jesus said, If ye have seen me, ye have seen the Father. Jesus and the Father are one. And when you get into this subject, your mind can explode because it's something that us humans just can't understand. But when Jesus Christ appears, John says, We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Paul says, Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his, meaning the Lord's glorious body. So we're going to get a body like the Lord. You know who most sons want to be like on this earth? Their father. Fathers need to, to desire to be like their heavenly father because their sons are looking up to them and they want to be just like them. So Jesus Christ is not the father, but he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. That's something you can't explain. In Revelation, it describes Jesus Christ in his glorified body. John falls to the ground when he sees Jesus Christ whose eyes are like a flame of fire, his head and his hair as white like wool, as white as snow, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So what you will be like when he appears is the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be just like him. And now are you thinking about that? Are you thinking about that day? Are you thinking about the blessed hope? That is the rapture. John says in verse 3 of the same chapter we're studying, in 1 John 3, in verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So the rapture is a purifying hope. And the fact that the Lord could pick you up at any moment is something that will make you want to live right. You don't want him to show up with you acting like a heathen. So if you know that time is close, then you'll straighten up. Something when it comes to your earthly father, when you know he is on his way home or somewhere close by, you're going to straighten up. All your mom has to say was, don't make me call your dad. So when he's close by, you're on your best behavior. When the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come back, it ought to make you want to be on your best behavior. Now, 1 John 3, 4 through 5 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin so we are all sinners romans 3 23 says for all have sinned and come true of the glory of god and paul said in romans 3 9 that we have before proved that both jews and gentiles that they are all under sin but John says here that he was manifested to take away our sins. So God was manifested in the flesh. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So God himself was manifest in the flesh. Now, 1 John 3, 4 through 5 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. You can't find sin in the Lord. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. 1 Peter 2, 22 says he did no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says he knew no sin. Hebrews 4, 15 said... He is without sin, and here in verse 5 of First John chapter 3, it says, And in him is no sin, so Jesus Christ is without sin. The Holy Ghost is without sin, and the Father is without sin. And growing up many times, we think our fathers can't do any wrong. We think everything they do is righteous. So kids are highly influenced by their fathers. Whatever you do, they think it's all right to do it. They see you cussing, and they think it's all right to cuss. You need to live a righteous life in front of them because you, they, the way they see God is how they see you is going to be the way they see God. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So if you abide in Jesus Christ, then you're not going to sin. The thing is, how often... To saved people abide in Christ. If you're reading your Bible and in prayer or doing something for the Lord, how much sinning are you doing during those times? Not much, if any at all. If you're truly abiding in Him, 
then you're not sinning at that time. And that is the practical application for the verse. Putting the verse in the future in light of the tribulation saint, there seems to be a sin that will show beyond any shadow of a doubt that you don't know God and that you aren't abiding in him. That is, the sin of worshiping the beast and taking his mark. In that age, unlike this age, you will have visible proof that a man is lost. That's something completely different from this age. In this age we're in today, there's nothing that if I did that could keep me from getting saved or to make me lose my salvation. But in that time period, you're going to have a mark that you can take, and that will keep you from getting saved. It's a completely different time. 1 John 3, 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So, no matter how many good things a lost sinner does with this time, he never does righteousness. Only a born-again believer can really work righteousness. And even that righteousness is only because you let Jesus Christ do it through you. All the righteous things you do as a saved man can only be because of Jesus Christ in you. And all the bad things you do is your fault. But let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So if we get some practical application for the church age out of this verse, then we can look at it like this. He that doeth righteousness here can only be a safe man because he's the only one who has Jesus Christ in him, who can do the righteousness through him. But physically, in his flesh, it's still wicked as the devil. And doctrinally, he doesn't have his own righteousness. He gets it from Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that he can do anything right. That's the only way he gets to go to heaven. That's the only way he can have rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But in the tribulation, it's a different story. Like I said, it goes back to similar to how it was in the Old Testament. Noah is said to have his own righteousness in Ezekiel 14, 14. And in Deuteronomy 6, 25, a man is said to have his own righteousness. While in the church age, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now in the Old Testament, all the, their righteous things they did, that stuff was never good enough to get them through to the third heaven. But it could be good enough to get them into paradise where they would wait on the Lord Jesus Christ to die and shed his blood for them. But in the tribulation, the marks between a righteous and wicked man will become extremely clear because of that mark and because of that worshiping of the Antichrist. Now, 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For, the, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So John says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. So a holiness preacher will take this verse and say, If you sin, then you lost your salvation. But he's failing to rightly divide. There has to be a sin in the tribulation that causes a man to automatically be of the devil, of that wicked one. And like I said, that's taking the mark and worshiping the beast. And if you know church age doctrine, then you know every Christian sins. Paul sinned. Peter sinned. Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? All of the disciples sinned. But none of them had the devil for a father. So this verse isn't to be placed doctrinally on the church, but we can get practical stuff. For example, you could say if a Christian sins, then when he sinned, he was led by the devil to do it. Just like when Peter tried to talk to the Lord out of going to the cross, Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. A Christian can be led by the devil, but no Christian's father is the devil. But that's just a spiritual application. It's doctrinally for the tribulation. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. So the devil has children. Everyone who is unsaved is actually a child of the devil. And Matthew twenty three fifteen talks about a child of hell. Acts thirteen ten talks about a child of the devil. Ephesians two two talks about children of disobedience. Ephesians two three talks about children of wrath. Second Peter two fourteen talks about cursed children. And in John 8, 44, Jesus Christ says to a bunch of hypocrites, Ye are of your father, the devil. So not everyone is a child of God. Now, as Christians, there are times when we don't act like a child of God. 
and we let the flesh, world, and the devil get the best of us, and we can actually act like we are a child of the devil. But if you have a good father, then he trained you up in the way you should go. But there were times when you disappointed or embarrassed him or made him feel ashamed a little bit, and you acted like you were some someone else's father, someone else's father's child. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. There were times when you acted up and your dad probably said you were raised better than that. So there's times when you're not acting like God's your father. You're acting like the devil's your father. Just like sometimes you act like some heathen raised you instead of your good father. Now John 3, 8, He that committed the sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Lord didn't destroy the works of the devil at his first coming. But he is going to at the second coming. At that time he will toss the Antichrist into the lake of fire. Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. And then at the end of the millennium, the devil and his army will be thrown into the lake of fire. The sons of God will, will the Son of God will completely destroy the works of the devil. The devil just gets beat up all the way through the Bible. And you know the saying, my daddy can beat up your daddy. God's been knocking the devil out since he first sinned. My God can beat up your God, your God of this world. 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this is a tough verse for many people, especially the holiness crowd. There are a lot of people that create heresy out of this verse. It says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So a holiness preacher will run with that thing and say, See, if you're saved, then you're not going to sin anymore. But he's forgetting that our flesh isn't born of God. It's the inner man that's born of God. When you got saved, the Lord cut your soul loose from your flesh. Now every time you sin, those sins are no longer applied to the soul. And that's why you get to go to heaven. Not because you quit sinning in the flesh. Your flesh has nothing to do with your salvation. So in a sense, the Lord sees you as sinless as Jesus Christ, but he also still sees you sin in the flesh, and that is why he chastises you. Hebrews 12, 8 says, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So just like your relationship with your earthly father, there is a sense in that a good father sees his kid as perfect, but in a sense he also sees how they misbehave and act up. And even though he sees their sins and has to whip them for it, he still loves them. So John says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commis commit sin. So you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have something in you that is sinless. Your flesh isn't born of God, but your spirit is. This means you're a child of God and not a child of the devil. But your flesh is still going to sin. But whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Remember, your flesh isn't born of God. And your flesh has nothing to do with your salvation. 1 John 3.10 says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So John's epistles, as we've been talking about, are heavy for the tribulation. But they also are for the church. But you just have to rightly divide. You have to familiarize yourself with the Pauline epistles and what he wrote to the church and filter what John writes through the Pauline epistles. There are no contradictions in the Bible. You just have to apply the verses doctrinally to who they apply to. Now, 1 John 3.10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth his brother. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So in the tribulation, the line between who is of God and who is of the devil is going to be extremely clear compared to how it is in the church age because of worship of the Antichrist and taking the mark will allow a man to buy or sell. And the righteous will know that it's a wicked thing to take the mark just to be able to buy or sell. And the righteous man's going to be poor. This is also why John continuously talks about helping your brother and loving your brother. 
In Matthew 25, the Lord judges between the sheep and the goats. The sheep are the ones who helped the brethren, and the goats are the ones who didn't help the brethren. This is the judgment of the nations, which takes place right before the millennial reign. And in the tribulation, the saints will have to stick together and die for each other and help each other and love their brother. They're going to have to lay down their life for each other. And verse 11 and 12 of 1 John 3, it says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that, least, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So just like your dad gets on to you for fighting with your brothers and sisters, so does the Lord. Notice that John refers to Cain as Abel's brother. So every time... John uses the word brother. He may not always be referring to a saved man. But as you know, Cain slew Abel. This shows us how religious people hate true Bible believers. They are jealous, as was Cain jealous. Now, 1 John 3.13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Like I said, people will hate you just because of who your father is. Romans 1 talks about haters of God. People hate God. Because he hates their sin. First John 3.14 We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So notice once again the talk about loving the brethren. A good sign you're saved is that you have a love for other Christians. And that's a good sign that you have passed from death unto life. And there are some people you have nothing in common with except that you both are saved and love the Lord and His Word, and if it wasn't for those things, you wouldn't give each other the time of day. Maybe it isn't like that in your family. You and your brother don't have anything in common other than you have the same father. You have the same family. So you get you get together and fellowship for that reason, even though you have nothing else in common. Now, 1 John 3.15 says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So don't let the word brother throw you off. John could be talking about a saved or lost man here. In a few verses earlier, you saw that he calls Abel Cain's brother. And we all know that Cain wasn't a righteous man. So if a man hates his brother, this doesn't mean the man has to be a saved person that he's referring to, to call him a brother. It's just not in that sense, you know. John says, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So does that mean a man is automatically lost if he commits murder? And that he would lose the eternal life that's in him if he committed murder? Absolutely not. A Christian is not a murderer. In the eyes of God, a Christian could have killed somebody before or after he was saved, and it wouldn't affect his salvation. He still wouldn't be a murderer. When God sees you, he doesn't see you as an adulterer or as a thief or a murderer. He sees you as righteous as Jesus Christ. And if you look at Revelation 21.8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice it says, All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Have you told a lie after you were saved? How many lies do you have to tell to make you a liar? You've got to tell one. So you've lied. Sure you have. Does that mean you're going to hell even though you have believed the gospel? Of course not. So how do you solve this problem? By remembering that you have imputed righteousness. When you got saved, you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to you. And then, not only this, but he doesn't apply your own wickedness to your record. And also remember that spiritual circumcision. When God cut your soul loose from your flesh, and now every time you sin, those sins aren't applied to the flesh, aren't applied to the soul. And if sin had any bearing on where a saved man went, then no saved man would go to heaven. No murderer or prideful or gossip gossiping person. But thankfully for us, we don't have our sins applied to our record. Our sins have nothing to do with whether or not we're going to heaven. Now, 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The Bible teaches that you should love other Christians so much that you would die for them. 
Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And during the tribulation, men are going to have to be tormented and killed. They're going to be threatened with torment if they don't tell the Antichrist henchmen where their brothers are hiding. You're not going to rat your brother out. You're going to help keep your brother alive. You're going to lay down your own neck for him. 1 John 3, 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Once again, John talks about helping a brother, because at the judgment of the nations, people will be judged on how they treated the brethren. Like I said, see Matthew 25 for the judgment of the nations. Now, 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. A true father doesn't just call you every now and then as a pity call and say, I love you. He shows his love in deed and in truth. He doesn't just send a birthday card that says, I love you. A real father comes to see you. So you, we, we show our, our love in deed and in truth. We, we need word. We need actions to back up our words. And just like our heavenly father, he loves in deed and in truth. He doesn't just say, God so loved the world. But he came down and died for us too. 1 John 3, 18 and 19 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. When you love in deed and in truth, loving, loving your neighbor as yourself, then you will fulfill the law. And this assures your heart that you're a child of God. You lose assurance when you sin. You don't lose salvation when you sin. But holy living brings assurance to your heart. And 1 John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. If your heart condemns you because you're sinning and you lost assurance, God is greater than your heart. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He isn't going to forget who was born again and who wasn't born again. He knoweth all things, as John says. And did it ever seem like your earthly father knew all things he knew when you came in late he knew you were doing something you weren't supposed to be doing it's like he always knew what you were doing first john three twenty one says beloved if our heart condemn us not then have we confidence toward god if your heart is condemning you then your heart isn't right get your heart right if you want to get your assurance back just like if you want to have that good relationship with your earthly father you don't just keep being mean to him and never apologize you come back and apologize and keep that relationship right that fellowship right with your earthly father but do you ever feel like the lord is mad at you he's never too mad to talk to you he wants you to be in close fellowship with him just like your earthly father the devil will try to convince you that you can't draw nigh to god but you can First John 3, 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So if we are living right, and ask things that are according to his will, then he will give us the desires of our heart. What are you praying for? Are you praying for something worth praying for? If you are, and you're living right, then the Lord just may give it to you. James said, You have not, because ye ask not. And just like when you ask your earthly father for something, is he more likely to give it to you when you've been mean or when, you do, when you're doing right? Is he more likely to give you an allowance when you've been good all week or when you've been bad all week? 1 John 3, 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. There's that commandment again, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. 1 John 3, 24 says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. So the Holy Spirit will confirm to you that you have been born again. And that's why Paul says in Romans eight sixteen, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But this has been 1 John chapter 3, verse by verse. And we've talked about fathers... You need to honor your earthly father, and you need to honor your heavenly father.